Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our Wednesday night Bible study. It's good to see so many of you on already, and um, I'm glad that uh, God has kept us uh, this week so far. And tonight we want to begin as quickly as possible. We do have a lot of ground to cover. And again, we're going to pray before we do anything. I want to make sure that if you have any prayer requests, please uh, keep them in your heart as we begin to pray. Let's continue to pray for our country and for our leadership in our country to make the right decisions. And of course, we want to pray for our peace here in our country as well. Uh, there's a lot going on in the world. And because of that, sometimes people become so fearful and worried. Let's pray for the peace that passes all understanding, that it will guard the hearts and minds of God's people. That is the mind of Christ. We need the mind of Christ. Amen. Let's go before the Lord in prayer right now. Mighty God, we're so grateful, thankful for your loving kindness that is better than life. We are so thankful, God, that you have given us joy unspeakable and full of glory. We're grateful for salvation. We're thanking you, God, for healing and for the power of Almighty God that has kept us so far. And this week, God, as we enter into your presence one more time as a group, not only to pray together, but to study your word together, we pray that you would give us wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. And give us, dear God, conviction so that the word of God will convict us to be what we ought to be. Would you heal the sick? Would you, Lord God, touch those that are going through struggles in their lives and, and bring them to a place, dear God, of deliverance? And Lord God, let the testimonies ring true. Let the testimonies ring out as people begin to tell of the amazing acts of our mighty God. And everybody said, in Jesus' name, amen. God is able, God is able, and he has given us such a wonderful uh, insight into his word, and we're so grateful today for that. As we go into the word of the Lord tonight, I want you to get your pens and your, uh, maybe you want to do screenshots because we will be moving fast. Um, it's a pretty big lesson. Next week will be as well as we talk about the structure of the tabernacle itself. But the tabernacle and Christ is the theme of our Bible study series. And tonight we want to go to the Word of God in Exodus chapter 26. And we have quite a lot to read. Now, because this is Bible study, I try my best to give you as many scriptures as possible. Not only that, but many references. We try to read as much so that you will get um, that, that exposure so that anything that I'm saying it might click with you as opposed to just giving you random um, scriptural references and then just talking over them. So we're going to try to give you a lot in terms of reading because it is a lot to take in. So you need to be able to see it for yourself and to see what I'm referencing. And as I begin to speak about the scriptures and tying the uh, tabernacle, its contents, or um, any part of the tabernacle to Jesus Christ, to the church, you will be able to see for yourself. Amen? So let's dig in right now. The Bible tells us in verse 1 of Exodus chapter 26, Moreover, you shall make the tabernacle with ten curtains of fine woven linen and blue, purple, and scarlet thread. With artistic designs of cherubim, that's angels, you shall weave them. The length of each curtain shall be 28 cubits, and the width of each curtain four cubits, and every one of the curtains shall have the same measurements. Five curtains shall be coupled to one another, and the other five curtains shall be coupled to one another. And you shall make loops of blue yarn on the edge of the curtains, uh, on the uh, selvage of one set. That The selvage is the bottom corner, the bottom corner of one set. And likewise, you shall do on the other, on the outer edge of the other curtain of the second set. 50 loops you shall make in the one curtain and 50 loops you shall make on the edge of the curtain that is on the end of the second set. 
that the loops may be clasped to one another. And you shall make 50 clasps of gold and couple the curtains together with the clasps so that it may be one tabernacle. You shall also make curtains of goat's hair to be a tent over the tabernacle. You shall make 11 curtains. The length of each curtain shall be 30 cubits and the width of each curtain four cubits and the 11 curtains shall all have the same measurements and you shall have and you shall couple five curtains by themselves and six curtains by themselves and you shall double over the sixth curtain at the front of the tent and you shall make 50 loops on the edge of the curtain that is outermost in one set and 50 loops on the edge of the curtain of the second set, and you shall make 50 bronze clasps, put the clasps into the loops, and couple the tent together that it may be one. The remnant that remains of the curtains of the tent, the half curtain that remains shall hang over the back of the tabernacle, and a cubit on one side and a cubit on the other side of what remains of the length of the curtains of the tent, shall hang over the sides of the tabernacle and on this side and on that side to cover it. You shall also make a covering of ram skins dyed red for the tent and a covering of badger skins above that. Now I'm going to read from Exodus chapter 36, but I'm not going to go through the whole thing because they're pretty much repeating. And because this is a longer lesson, you can read the rest for yourself. But Exodus 36 is where now they begin to fulfill the task of making these curtains. And uh, we will see that from the very beginning. All the gifted artisans. So we, 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 got, we get the directive from God. And now all is being done to get the curtains ready. The Bible says, Then all the gifted artisans among them who worked on the tabernacle made ten curtains woven of fine linen and of blue, purple, and scarlet thread with artistic designs of cherubim, they made them. And we will stop right there. Now, last week, we covered the table, the showbread, the lampstand, and the oil. And this week, we are now covering the curtains and the coverings. The curtains and the coverings. You might say, well, why is it this so important, you know, having curtains and a, a tent made over the tabernacle. Everything that's written in the word of God is so important. And as you begin to look at what is going to unfold tonight, you'll begin to see that God speaks to his people in so many different ways. Uh, I wish God would speak to us in just words and we could hear them. But God has chosen to speak through types and shadows and through prophecies. And because of that, we have to pay very careful attention. Is it possible that God knows us? You know, we are conversationalists. We love to talk. And how many times have you ever had the experience where someone would actually come up to you, you hadn't seen them for a long time, and they greeted you. And at the end of this conversation, where you caught up, it may have been years, and they turn back and they go, I'll call you. And you know they're not going to call you. Hey, listen, we're conversationalists. The Lord said, if you seek me, you will find me. Maybe this is God's way of doing it. But I want you to know that there's a whole lot to uncover with the tabernacle. The linen curtain is pretty much what covers the entire tabernacle, as we've read. And in this was fine twined linen given priority over the purple, the, the, the blue, and the scarlet colors. All right? Not all other parts of the tabernacle, the colors are named first, but linen is named here first. It's made from flax, a product of the oil. Now, if you remember when they were leaving Egypt, the Lord told them to borrow, quote unquote. They were never going back, so it was going to be theirs. Uh, all of the, 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 the fine um, linens and and, and all other kinds of fabrics and materials and gold and silver and bronze. And the children of Israel left Egypt rich. The linen here was Egyptian linen. And it was made of the finest of, 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 of materials. And so the Lord knew what he was doing when he told the children of Israel to do what they, uh, what they did. So that when it was time 
to build the tabernacle that they would have what they need. Let me tell you something. When God is doing something, he will always provide for himself. Everything that we try to do for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, he will always provide the resources. And if the resources don't come and you've been praying about it, it means you just need to wait. Remember, the Bible says that, you know, we should wait on the vision. You know, if it tarries, don't panic, wait on it. And so one special feature in this curtain were, was that there were several cherubims that were designed into it and you can see it at the top there one special feature was what were the cherubims they were indeed um treading on holy ground if you if you will there was it was a reminder every time these priests would go into the tabernacle or if the people looked at the tabernacle it would remind them that they were serving a holy god and what they were about to do engaging in worship and uh, seeking after God and fulfilling their responsibilities spiritually, that it was very, very serious as far as God was concerned. Now, fine linen represents God's righteousness. God's righteousness. And we'll see that as we go through. But there are scriptures to not only verify that, but the righteousness is also conveyed, if you will, and attributed to the saints or to the church. So this is very important. What God did all those centuries ago were, was to depict exactly what we would have in these last days in the church. Now, the fine linen represents the righteousness of God and therefore the righteousness of Christ. And in the book of Revelation, chapter 19, um, it is also, as I said, attributed to the saints. This is where it's found. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory for the marriage of the lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready. And to her, it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints, the righteous acts of the saints. God created us to be just like him, but we lost it. And now he's trying to bring us back. He took an ancient people and he tried to cultivate within them a love, but an understanding of who they were by having the tabernacle built and putting certain protocols in place for them to approach him spiritually, to teach them again how they should approach the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords but most importantly, to teach them who they were. And this is very important. Amen. And so that righteous, that, that, that linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Everything we do, we say, we, how we live is very important. So if the fine linen represents God's righteousness, according to what we've read here, let's see what the Bible has to say about our righteousness or the righteousness of the church as well. It tells us here in the book of Romans chapter 3, but now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Now it's referencing the Old Testament. Even the righteousness of God, here we go again, through faith in Jesus Christ to all and, and on all who believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation or atonement by his blood, through faith to demonstrate his righteousness, because in his forbearing, in other words, when, when it says his forbearing, it means that God put up with our sins. Yes, he allowed the world to continue in its sin, and he tried his best to contact his people and to make us see who he was. So in his forbearance, God had passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness that he might be just and a justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus and that is Jesus Christ. Now, that righteousness comes to us, the church, through faith. Here again, until we come to Christ the way he says, we will have no righteousness that is bestowed upon us because we have sinned and we are imperfect. 
but we need the righteousness of God through Christ because we believe and because we have faith in him, he, he grants us his righteousness through grace. Now, the Bible uses the word forbearance here. In other words, his grace covers us in spite of who we are, what we've done, and sometimes continue to do. But because we've sinned, and we're going to look at that, it, it, it doesn't mean that because God has forgiven us and God is covering us with our grace, that is okay with God. And we won't touch that right now, but we're going to touch it in a little bit uh, from here. But this, the Apostle Paul was trying to explain to them that this righteousness comes through the faith of Jesus Christ. Now, the Apostle Peter in 2 Peter chapter 1 tells us, Simon Peter, uh, a, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to, who, to those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. So let's just kind of break this down a little bit. So the Apostle Paul says, we have this righteousness through our faith. The Apostle Peter comes in and he says, listen, um, we are, uh, because of God's demonstrated love for us, we have this righteousness bestowed upon us through our faith in Christ Jesus, right? And then he tells us that as his divine power has given to us all things who called us by his glory and virtue. So the Lord is calling all peoples of the world. The Bible says many are called, but few are chosen, but he's calling everybody. But those who reject him cannot be chosen. Amen. And then it says, by which have been given to us exceeding great and precious promises that through these you may be partakers, partakers now. So we are partakers of his divine nature. So when you come to God, according to the scripture here, you are coming to him to be changed. And we now are partakers of the divine nature. So how could any Christian ever think for one second that God who is holy doesn't want us to be holy as he is. So when I read the word of God, I don't see what I'm seeing in Christianity. I see something totally different. And if we choose to see the word of God, God will reveal these things to us. But it's when we decide to just kind of take a glance at God's word and not really look at it or study it, we miss the value of what God is trying to create in us. When he created Adam and Eve, and subsequent to that, we were all were born through the ages. God never intended for us to be born in sin and shapen in iniquity. He designed us to be just like him and to live forever. But sin canceled out all of that. Christ came to give it back to us. Then God now uses his enabling grace, his enabling grace to impart to us believers the grace to be partakers of that divine nature. Amen. Now it is our faith and obedience in Christ and his sacrifice on the cross that allows us to receive from God his righteousness. So just as the fine linen curtains were with the 50 clasps or tatches, as the King James Version um, specifies that these clasps are, that tatches uh, as they reference is, which the Bible tells us it shall be one tabernacle. God has one church, one church. The Bible tells us, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, right? One Lord. We have to keep in mind that God isn't a God of multiplicity in terms of deity. He's one God, and he has called us to one salvation plan through Christ Jesus, the only one that can give us this salvation. So it's our faith now if we believe and obey. So it's not just as some Christians say, just believe and God will give it to you. It has to be faith and obedience to his word. 
And of course, what does his word tell us to do? You have to go into the word and to see what the Lord Jesus Christ said, amen, in St. John chapter 3 and in Acts chapter 1 and in Acts chapter 2, and you will see that Jesus told them what to do and they obeyed, amen, for them to be saved. And that's important because we are partakers of his divine nature. Amen. Now, the Bible teaches us that God is a holy and righteous God, and he takes this very, very seriously. So in Colossians chapter 1 and 26, it tells us the mystery which has been hidden from ages and from generations. You, you, you see, you see what, what I'm telling you here? God has hidden these things. So unless you are seeking after him, you won't even get it. You will not understand it. You have to cry out to him and you have to be taught these things. Thank God for pastors and teachers and evangelists that are out there teaching and preaching this and, and, and Sunday school teachers and just saints of God that love to just teach the word of God. And I want you to know something. When we're teaching it, the hungry will come to us and they will make a choice to serve him if in their hearts they truly are seeking after him. Amen. And so the Bible tells us here, to them God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. The mystery of all of this is that the Lord chose the Jewish nation. They rejected God. But even in the Old Testament, the Bible prophesied that God would reach out beyond the Jewish nation to the Gentiles for a people that he would place his name on. And that's us, the Gentiles. Amen. Isn't God wonderful? I just love him today. So if we want to be with him in eternity, we should take our salvation and our faith in Christ very, very seriously. Now notice the loops, right? The 50 loops of blue on the edge of each section and the 50 tatches of gold to couple the sections of the curtains together. Now, everything that God does has an order to it. Amen. And notice how the measurements gives a sense of order and also completeness. It's very important for us to see that because when we, the church, live in God's righteousness, we are in alignment and in agreement with God. But we've got to live not in our own personal or understood righteousness, we have to get to that place where we understand his righteousness and apply that to our lives. So why do you have so many different factions of Christianity? Everybody's applying their own variation of righteousness. Well, God didn't really mean this. And this is really what God said, ignoring scriptures. And I hate when I see that because it breaks my heart that there are people with good intentions, but they have missed the awesomeness of God's trying to reach, God trying to reach out to them. Amen. So when the church lives in God's righteousness, we are in alignment and agreement with God. When we don't, we're not in alignment with God. We are definitely not in agreement with God at all. Amen. And we have to keep that in mind. Now, that 50, that's very important right there because the Bible ties this into even the year of Jubilee, which is also tied into our salvation and grace that has been given to us in these times, amen, beyond the time of Moses and Joshua and the children of Israel. And so that year of Jubilee is super important. The Bible tells us in the book of Leviticus and beginning at verse uh, 10 of chapter 25, and you shall consecrate the 50th year and proclaim liberty, proclaim liberty. Now that's very important. I'm, we're gonna be touching that again. Proclaim liberty to all the land, to all its inhabitants. It shall be a jubilee for you, and each of you shall return to his possession, and each of you shall return to his family. So let me break that down again for you. The children of Israel, being human, they would make bad decisions. They would manage their property, um, you know, their money, just like sometimes some of us do without wisdom, and they would lose it. And sometimes because they weren't paying attention to what they were doing, they would have someone else come in and uh, cheat them out of what they had. Subsequently, they would end up being in um, 
you know, serv servitude to somebody because they owed them money, they borrowed money to do something. And then, you know, it's the same as today, right? Usury, you tell the bank, I'm going to buy this house, I can pay the mortgage. But then when you don't, they come and they take your house, right? They take your car because you're not paying attention or you bought something you couldn't really afford. You knew you couldn't afford it. You hope things would change. Same difference, just a different era, all right? So they would run into problems with trying to, to, to take care of uh, the things that God had given to them. So in verse 11, it says, that 50th year shall be a jubilee to you. And they're going to explain what that means in a second. In it, you shall neither sow nor reap what grows of its own accord, nor gather the grapes of your untended vine, for it is the jubilee. It shall be holy to you, and you shall eat its produce from the field. In this year of Jubilee, now catch this, each of you shall return to his possession. Whatever you lost, you're going to get it back. And if you sell anything to your neighbor or buy from your neighbor's hand, you shall not oppress one another. According to the number of years after the Jubilee, you shall buy from your neighbor. And according to the number of years of crops, he shall sell to you. Verse 16 says, according to the multitude of years, you shall increase its price. And according to the fewer number of years, you shall diminish its price. For he sells to you according to the number of the years of the crops. Therefore, you shall not oppress one another, but you shall fear your God, for I am the Lord your God. And it is quite unlike even how Christians treat one another today. I know Christians that own businesses, but they are meaner than rattlesnakes and they misrepresent God in so many ways. They 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 um, charge exorbitant uh, interest rates and they they will never even give the saints of God a break on a price or anything like that. And of course, they have to make money. I get that. And they should. But sometimes you have a mother who in, uh, of Zion or someone who's not doing so well and we're not even good to each other. The Bible says God is not pleased with that. We, we ought to look out for one another. And the person that has more should always try to help those who have less. Amen. So now check this out. Every 50th year, right, was to be a year of Jubilee. Every 50th year. Now, debts were canceled. Mortgages were released. And slaves, and anyone that was in indentured servitude, they were set free. This was the grace of God exemplified. Amen. And that is exactly what Jesus Christ came to do for us. The Lord was showing them grace all the way back then. Of course, the law being a harsh schoolmaster, whatever they did wrong, they were chastised severely for it, where we're getting off real easy in these last days and people are abusing that. They're abusing the grace of God and that is not right because God is not pleased. Remember we were talking about uh, the, 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 the proclaiming of liberty at the beginning of, of this uh, chapter that we read here, that you shall consecrate the 50th year and proclaim liberty. Well, I want to share something with you right now, because in the book of uh, Luke chapter four, Jesus picks up the book and he begins to read the spirit of the Lord. And he's re reading from Isaiah 61. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. Check this out now to proclaim liberty. Amen. Does not get you how God just ties things in. Isaiah comes by and he picks up right from Leviticus and he begins to prophesy of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, several hundred years later, he picks up the book and he begins to read about himself to the Jews that were there and anyone that would listen that he was that one that he came to do what Isaiah said. He said, he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of, the, of sight to the blind, to set at liberty, there's that word again, those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. So you ended up in trouble. The Lord says, this is your year of Jubilee. Amen. So you, you lost it all and you don't know what to do. There's no one that cares for your soul. The Lord says, I'm here to give it back to you pressed down, shaken together, and it will be running over. The Bible says that men shall pour these things into your arms, shall give unto you 
what you don't have because God will send them to do it. God will send them to do it. Jesus stopped reading in the middle of a sentence, right? Because in Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 2, and you can check it out for yourself, the verse went on to say, proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God. But Jesus had not come to fulfill that part as yet. He had come to die to make atonement for our sins. And remember what the Bible says in St. John chapter 3 and verse 17, for God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. So Jesus had not come to judge, but he's coming back to judge. And when he does, you will see, amen, that what he read here will add the other portion to it. That is salvation through his grace, amen, through his grace given to us through his sacrifice on Calvary, amen. And at Calvary, Jesus canceled our debt sin. He canceled it, amen. Just like the 50 tatches, just like the 50 tatches were, were, were canceled as it were, amen. And so it's important for us to keep these things in mind and to understand that God has a way of touching our lives. That jubilee is ours. I want you to look at Exodus chapter 26, right here and verse 33. It says, and you shall hang the veil from the clasp. Then you shall bring the ark of the testimony in there behind the veil. The veil shall be a divider for you between the holy place and the most holy. Access to God, in other words, was limited. Access to God was limited. Isn't that something? When we have limited access to God, there is just no way we're going to ever be able to reach him. No way that we're going to ever be able to reach him. He's a good God and he's an awesome God. Hallelujah, hallelujah, amen. And it's important for us to keep these things in mind because in Matthew 27, we see access granted. The Bible says, then behold, the veil of the temple when Jesus Christ was crucified on the cross was torn in two from top to bottom and the earth quaked and the rocks were split. Matthew 27, 51, amen. The earth quaked and the rocks split. And that curtain that was designed by these artisans because God gave Moses what to do and how to create it, it was torn from the top to the bottom. Amen. Only a man could tear it from the bottom to the top. You would need a giant. God tore that thing and he opened up access to the holy of holies for his people. Amen. So the veil and the class both relate to Calvary. Amen. And when Jesus canceled the sin debt on Calvary, amen, you find in Hebrews chapter 4, 16, it tells us, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So all that happened in the tabernacle was God trying to tell us people, you're in danger by not listening to me. There's a world out there that is wicked. They will tear you apart. They will destroy you. You are my people. If you stay close to me, I'll take care of you and I'll cover you. And the plan of the tabernacle was uh, in, in essence depicting that to them then and to us now. And you'll see that as we go along. Next, the goat's hair curtain was also um, um, designed and, and made. Now the fine twine linen was there. Now the goat's hair uh, curtain was also there. And in, in 26, uh, the 26th chapter of Exodus and beginning at verse seven, it says, you shall also make curtains of goat's hair to be a tent over the tabernacle. You shall make 11 curtains. Verse nine tells us, and you shall couple five curtains by themselves and six curtains by themselves. And you shall double over the six curtain at the forefront of the tent. These two distinct sections suggest a double typological meaning. So let's look at that. First, the goat's hair, uh, it, it typifies the sin of man. So all have sinned, the Bible says, and come short of the glory of God. And so we needed to have something 
that would take away our sins. Amen. And if you read through you, you, the, 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 um, the, the Old Testament and from Exodus, Leviticus, you will, you will see w what happened with that. And we'll touch that in a second. But the goat's hair can, uh, curtain typifies the sin of man. Everybody sinned. Adam and Eve sinned, threw us all into sin. Goats are a type, number two, of deception in the Bible. So that's the dual typological meaning here. Remember, Rebecca used kids' skins to deceive Isaac and to mistaking Jacob for Esau. Remember that? David's wife, Michal, used a goat's hair pillow to deceive Saul's messengers. And then in the judgment of the nations, according to Matthew chapter 25, verse 31, Jesus said that the people or the nations would be separated uh, according to goats and sheep. And so the angels would separate them. In the last day judgment, anyone that doesn't follow Christ or gave their lives to Christ would be considered goats. Amen. So the goat's hair can, curtain is called uh, the, the covering, the tent covering, which covered the entire tabernacle. It was part of the tent covering as well. Now, in those days, um, all these goats typified uh, sin and Christ in our time typifies uh, that sin offering that would the priest would place his hand on top of the head of that goat and release it. And so Christ, just like that goat was released into the wilderness, is our scapegoat, if you will. He who committed no sin became sin for us. Amen. He took it all on him so that we would be set free. Now, in Isaiah 53 and verse 10, it tells us this. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, that's Isaiah 53, 10, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hands. Next, the Bible tells us in 1 Peter 2, 21 and 22, for to this you were called because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps, who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth, nor deceit found in his mouth. And in 2 Corinthians 5.21, it tells us, for he made him who knew no sin. To be sin for us, Second Corinthians five twenty one, that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. Now let's go back real quick so that we can just kind of like bring this to the forefront. That Second Peter tells us here. It says here, for to this you were called because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example. So as Christians in these last days, Jesus Christ is our example. Example of what exactly? It tells us right here that you should follow his steps. Why do you think I keep telling you guys, we've got to be holy before the Lord and that don't follow mainstream Christianity. They are doing something different than what this book is telling us to do. Let's be obedient to the word of the Lord today. Amen. And this is important for us. The scapegoat was also used to make an atonement for Israel in Leviticus chapter uh, 16 and verse 10, it bore the iniquities onto a land that was not inhabited. So when the priest laid his hands on top of that goat's head and literally transferred the sins of all the nation of Israel onto that goat, that goat was released into a wilderness. Remember, Jesus went into a wilderness and Jesus was out there um, and fasted 40 days and 40 nights. But I want to explain something to you. When he came back from that so-called wilderness, he remained in the wilderness of a sinful world for you and I and died on the cross so that you and I would have forgiveness of sins. Amen. And Leviticus 20, 22, amen. That Christ that we have right now, amen, hallelujah, is our sin offering that represents that uh, that is written in Leviticus 20, amen, to, uh, 20 to 22. Now, as far as uh, the east is from the west, Psalm 103 and verse 12 tells us, that's how far the Lord has removed our transgressions from us. 
as far as the east, God said, I don't want you to be sinners. And until you can get to that place where I can cover you with my grace, until I can pour my spirit into you, God says every year that sin offering would remove your sins for one year. Can you imagine that Jesus Christ died for your sins and mine? And he says that any sin that you've committed up to that point was erased. That's why if you sin now, the Bible says we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. We get on our knees and we ask God to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all filthiness of the flesh. Now, let's get to the ram's skin, which is dyed red. Now, rams were used for consecrating the priests for office. Amen. Amen. And, um, and of course, let me just, I, I missed this scripture, so let me drop this on you. For those who think that if you're a Christian, you can continue to sin, the Bible tells us in Romans 6 and verse 1, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? We should never sin. Amen. But if we do, we have an advocate with Jesus Christ, the righteous. Amen. With the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. The ram skins tells us clearly, and you can go to Exodus 26, verse 14. We read it already. Rams were used for consecrating the priests for office. Amen. Now, one for a burnt offering. That's Exodus 29, 15 to 18. And another for the consecration of the priests it's in themselves in Exodus 29, 19 to 22. Now, as our great high priest, Jesus Christ himself was consecrated. Yes, he was. Let's go to the scriptures to prove that. John chapter 17, that's St. John 17 and 19. This is Jesus now. He said, as thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. So Jesus was both our high priest, our great high priest, and our sacrifice, and he sanctified himself. Isn't that something? The priest had to sanctify the, 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 the actual uh, scapegoat, but Jesus Christ himself, being that scapegoat, sanctified himself, but he made himself, amen, a sacrifice as well. And so the Bible tells us for such an high priest became for, for such an high priest became us who is holy, harmless. So in other words, he became like us. The Lord God Almighty, King of Kings and Lord of Lords, took on the form of flesh, of man, and became like a human being. That's what that is saying. For such an high priest became us who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens who needeth not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice first for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did once when he, amen. He did this once when um, he died for our sins, right? He offered himself up for the law makes men high priests which have infirmity, but the word of the oath, which was since the law, maketh the son who is consecrated for evermore forevermore so jesus made himself amen consecrated for us and the word of the lord tells us in philippians chapter 2 and verse 7 through 8 that he jesus made himself of no reputation taking the form of a bond servant and coming in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death even the death of the cross. Amen. So ram skins represents Christ, our suffering high priest, consecrated forevermore. First, he was our atoning sacrifice, and now he is the mediator between God and man, Christ Jesus, the one that saved our souls. He's the mediator. I just love him today. Ram skins undyed were not sufficient enough. And so we needed something else. The Bible tells us in Hebrews 9:22. Amen. That just as the lambskin was dyed, dyed red, and according to the law, most all things were purified with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. That red, that dyed red 
uh, or red dye signified the shedding of blood and Christ shed his blood for you and I as our sacrifice. And he gave himself like the high priest would uh, slaughter that, that sacrifice. He gave himself as a sacrifice for you and I in these last days. Now let's look at the badger skin. That's important. Amen. The Bible tells us in Exodus chapter 26 and verse 14, you shall also make a covering of ram skins dyed red for the tent and a covering of badger skins above that. So if you notice, you have cover upon cover upon cover. The badger skin was the thickest or the toughest. So that means it protected everything that was underneath. So in the cold of night, it was warm inside and during the daytime, it was cool even in the scorching desert because it was so insulated, if you will. So God knew what he was doing. His priest had to go in there. And so he had to protect that priest no matter what the temperature was to be able to keep that priest in a position to do his job. Amen. And so this covering was enough. Badger's king was a tough material. You know what the Lord told them in the book of Ezekiel when they sinned? He said, I clothed you in embroidered cloth and gave you sandals of badger skins. I clothed you with fine linen and covered you with silk. Does this kind of like reflect back to what was done in the tabernacle? So here God is, is using the same uh, typology, if you will, to explain to the children of Israel that I'm your covering. I'm your badger skin, if you will. And I'm covering you so that you don't have to pay the price that I require because you've sinned. If you would just ask me to forgive you, he always told Israel over and over, just ask me to forgive you. If my people, which are called by my name, would humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I would hear from heaven. God said, I would forgive your sins. I would heal your land. And so when God said, I'm going to forgive you, even back then he did it every single time. And he's telling these people that were yet again walking away from him. Let me remind you who clothed you with embroidered cloth and gave you sandals of badger skin. In other words, to protect your feet when you were in the wilderness. I clothed you with fine linen and covered you with silk. Yeah, the Lord was trying to tell them there's a whole lot that was was riding on this. You know, his protection was was important for them to understand. And the badger skin protected that entire tabernacle. The exterior also concealed, protected and safely preserved all of the inner beauty of the tabernacle. Remember when we were reading the scriptures previously? During this Bible study, we said that there was a time when God was hidden. Yeah, he was hidden. And then when the veil was torn, it granted us access into seeing him. But the holy things of God were covered. They were covered. And so that 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 tabernacle was protected by all those curtains and subsequent to all those, the badger skin finally on the top to conceal and to protect everything. Notice the front, the back, the sides of the tabernacle covered. Only the priests could go inside. The people couldn't. They were not worthy to go on the inside of the tabernacle. And you and I should count it a privilege that we can come boldly before the throne of grace. The exquisite beauty that was inside abounded. Amen. And it, the, the, the world never saw it. They, they, the, the children of Israel weren't allowed to see it. And yet the tabernacle in these times symbolizes the structure that houses the presence and majesty of God in us and in the church. So in the church at large, but each individual, because remind, be reminded what um, the Apostle Paul told the church in Corinth. He says, don't you know that you are the temple of the Holy Ghost? So we are now the tabernacle. Somebody will say, well, no, the tabernacle or the temple in these last days is the church. Yes, but individually, the Lord sees you and I as he saw that tabernacle in the wilderness. And he expects everything that's housed in this flesh 
to be holy and to be righteous unto him. Now, I'm going to share this one last scripture with you real quick, found in Isaiah chapter 53. It says, Who hath believed our report? This is Isaiah the, the prophet. And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant. This is now a prophecy of Jesus Christ. And as a root out of a dry ground, he has no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. And he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, but yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray and have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all, all our sins. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before his shearers is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. He opened not his mouth. God used the tabernacle to prophesy of the coming of Christ and our redemption. Amen. Don't you just love the word of the Lord tonight? Don't you just love what God is doing? Amen. In his church in these last days and, and revealing to us, amen, that as he spoke to Moses and the prophets, that he was actually telling them secretively of his future church. It's a wonderful thing, amen, to know that God has revealed through the ages who he is and who we are as the body of Christ, that he's our covering, that he would come and die for us. And he depicted that even in the tabernacle of old. Let us go before the Lord in prayer. I hope this Bible study um, was a help to you. You may have to go back over a lot of this again because I move pretty fast. But understand that the Old Testament is linked to the New Testament. Amen. And you and I are a product of God's prophecies and we have Christ within us, the hope of glory in these last days. Let's pray. Mighty God, we thank you. Thank you for your loving kindness. We thank you for your words tonight. And again, we pray for wisdom, Lord, knowledge and understanding so that God, as a people, we will grow and we will grow in righteousness, God, through our faith in you so that we may put off, Lord, the old individuals that we were, God, full of sin and so weak, God, in the flesh, but help us to become strong, God, in the Lord and in the power of your might. And Lord God, I pray for those that are weak among us, that they, Lord God, will have patience even with themselves and wait on you, never turning their backs on you until, God, you bring them to that place of full deliverance. And we will thank you for it in Jesus' name. And everybody said, in Jesus' name, amen. Remember to like, share, and subscribe. Share this with your family members and especially those that um, you know are shut in. Let's, let's do something that will get them the word of the Lord and hopefully the word of God will begin to work on their hearts and in their minds and in their spirits and help them to come to the realization that they need Christ in their lives. God bless you until Sunday. Amen.